might as well be built in stone. When on the water, it's very easy to move things in and out, change things, reconfigure things. Um, so it gives us a lot of flexibility. And so things are going to evolve very quickly. And I think this what what, what makes this so exciting is that there's so much where there's so many places where this can go, and there's so much evolution that can take very place very very quickly. And there's so much technological innovation that's going to happen very quickly because we need to figure out so many different things and solve so many different things. And we should do this before we go try to go to Mars. If you have listened to you know the latest shows, latest episodes uh, with Titus Gable and Jeff Booth talking about you know deflation economics and and also the episodes where. Uh, the special episodes where I talk about, you know, my film project or our film project, uh, human life rooted in Bitcoin. You know, I talk about, I talk about a vision. You know, uh, I, talk, I talk about, you know, what is possible with deflationary economics, def um, exponential technologies, with free private cities. You know, and so, yeah. And this is why I'm really excited to announce my next episode with Grand Ramon, the CEO and founder of Ocean Builders. Uh, it's going to be. We're going to cover a lot of uh, questions and topics, and uh, you know I, I also want him on board with our film project because uh, once he's ready to go, we're going to film that and really give humanity, give the people the first glimpse, the first feeling, the first you know comprehension of what it would be like to live, uh, you know, in freedom, in in sea, whatever you want to call it, sea, sea, sea pods, land pods, uh, citadel cities, free private cities. Uh, you know, where your private properties are protected, your well-being uh, is being taken care of, your security, your safety, much more efficiently, much more cheaper, actually, ev you know, cheaper and, and, and better, with better services, be you know, more innovative products and services. So without further ado, I'm really excited to have to start with Grav Ramund. Let me know if you have any questions, and if you want to you know, contribute in any shape or form, please give me a DM or email me at hello at thetotalconnector.com. And now we're going to connect it all together. Have fun. Welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevin Davani. My very special guest is Grant Rom Romund, and uh, he is uh, the CEO and founder of uh, Ocean Builders. Um, thank you so much for your time, Grant, and welcome to the show. Yeah, no problem. I'm great. I'm happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, listen, I mean, Grant, I, I've actually, um, I told you about, you know, this interview that you had with Beth, and uh, I find your, you know, your personal history, your background also very interesting, because you, it seems like you also went through a personal, spiritual, you know, emotional, physical catharsis. <laughs> And yeah. uh, so anybody who wants to watch it, I'm going to put the link up. Um, uh, but I just thought maybe you want to give my listeners a little bit of background, like uh, what's your, because I see you as a technologist, entrepreneur, and now, you know, you're the founder and CEO of Ocean Builders, which I totally like resonate with, with the vision you have. Uh, and maybe even, you know, is uh, like, if you have a connection to Bitcoin, uh, maybe tie that in. Sure. Okay, so uh, I wrote my first computer program when I was like eight, just a very simple one. That was back in 1980. So I'm, I've always kind of been on the edge of technology. Uh, and that was, you know, pretty bleeding edge at that time. Um, and I was, the, I think, the first in Canada to be in a, a computer science fair program with the, well, first that had a computer at a computer, uh, at a science fair uh, at a young age. So it was pretty interesting. Um, and so I've always been on top of technology. I've always kind of been, uh, I always kind of looked at life like things didn't really make sense because it seemed like people were doing things in ways that didn't really make sense. It seemed like there was a, always a better way. And so I've always been trying to find out how can we use technology to make that better way in our lives. Uh, so I've always had that kind of visionary look. Uh, ahead. And um, so I've, I started, I, I guess I have quite a long history of uh, developments over the years. I started, to, I've always loved the sea. I've always loved being on the water. And I was involved with a project about 20 some odd years ago where we wanted to build a ship that was going to be one mile long that was going to circumnavigate the world. Uh, every two years and stop at different ports of call. And I thought this would be the most amazing place on the world. You could have total freedom, you could travel, uh, but also at the same time have your home right there with you. 
I thought that would be ultimate freedom. I thought that would be incredible. So I was really excited about that. The problem with, with that was that it was going to cost about uh, $7 billion to start the project. And that was like 20 plus years ago. I can't hear you, your audio anymore. No, I just so, muted myself. A, it's all good. This is a, Are we all good? I, I just muted myself. Um, just I can't hear it. Oh, there it is. Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay. So um, I was really excited about that, but it just was going to take too much to actually get started. Uh, so I kind of put that on the side for many years. Um, and I started a, um, a startup company for, uh, I was actually started an online education series for hairdressers. Um, totally different track. My father's a hairdresser, so I'm a second generation in the business. And then um, that led to um, creating a mobile education app. And then that became really popular. We had uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of hairdressers around the world watching our show. Um, so that was, that was really going well. And then I showed that app to some big corporate clients like Wella Professionals, Clairol, OPI, um, uh, Sebastian, and you know a lot of the big beauty industry brands and they all loved it and they wanted to for us to build a brand uh, an app for them so i have a whole development team now that does mobile app development for the professional beauty industry so i have a lot of tech background and i've just used it in various ways um and did you want me to get into the health issues that i had or i, I don't know yeah maybe part of it uh what was like? Uh, what was your path to, to to this to this you know to this vision that you've you know developed now? Um, is there like is there connection to you know what you've been going through like health wise or, or physically, emotionally, uh, spiritually even? Yeah. Um, so I back in two thousand nine, I was living in San Francisco. We kind of I, I, we had a tech frat house, kind of. Um, that had a lot of very tech savvy people. One of the co-founders of PayPal was one of the original six was, was in the house and had some other, a lot of tech savvy people in the house. Uh, so they were encouraging me to do more online things that were, uh, that could scale better than, um, what I was doing at the time. So they kind of encouraged me with that. Uh, and it was also around that time that I started getting really, really sick. Um, my health was just really bad and I didn't know, I didn't know what was going on. Doctors weren't much help in diagnosing it. It took many years for them to figure out what what was wrong, what was going on. And uh, it was, I think, about three or four years later where they actually figured out what it was. Um, so that led to the point where I was in hospital for a long, you know, several times for long for long, for many years, and I was I was really on my deathbed for. For a long time and um, I kind of went through the whole point where you have to really figure out what your life is about and if you want to really stay here or not because it was it was at that point and um, so you kind of when you're faced with that kind of situation you really are forced to, to think and to reevaluate your life and reevaluate how you're living and how you're um, just like everything from A to Z. So um, uh, I, I basically woke up every morning and uh, every morning, like I got up like eight o'clock or whatever it was, and I started to fight. I just started to fight every day, just fighting to stay alive, doing everything you can imagine for health to, um, to I looked at every alternative therapy and, everything you can imagine to, to try to get better. And, uh, it, I slowly, slowly got better and better and better. And finally in 2016, kind of everything just magically came together. And, uh, I, I was fully healed, which was like a huge miracle. Um, and, uh, I guess tying it back to Bitcoin, I, uh, well, from, the Freedom Ship Project. I was. I love the idea of freedom. I love the idea of being able to travel and have your home with you and um, have this incredible lifestyle that uh, I thought would be amazing. And then uh, it, 
when I first heard about Bitcoin in, I think, 2000, was the same year of the the, uh, 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 issue in Cyprus when the banks were doing their... I think it was 2013, 14, something like 2013, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 2012 or 13, probably 13. Mm -hmm. And uh, as soon as I heard about it, it's like, wow, this is it. And my friend told me about it. It was... uh, it was like sixty-five dollars, and I thought, "Oh, I, I got to get, I got to get some." And I, uh, it took me a week to figure out how to get some. Uh, it, it, it was, was like it must have been like difficult at that time, right? Because it's, it's like you know nowadays it has got much much better, like you know from usability or you know whatever mobile wallet, hard wallets, uh, the keys that you can you know manage yourself, right? Yeah. Like at that time, I think I didn't want to send money off to uh, Mount Gox in Japan to to buy some Bitcoin. I wasn't comfortable doing that. So I just kept on searching for a way to to get it in in Canada where I was. And I I eventually got some on local Bitcoin. Uh, I overpaid for it. So I paid instead of $120, I got it for $130. But who wouldn't mind $130 Bitcoin now, right? Um, so I got one, $130. So, um, and then a few more throughout the year before, and as it was running up to the, uh, the, the big run up to, uh, the big, the, that big crash of that year, not the, not the biggest crash of, of Bitcoin's history, but certainly, a, a, a huge one at that time. So, uh, so that brings us up to date with, uh, with that. And then. Now with Ocean Builders, uh, I was living in a floating house in Toronto for about three and a half years. It's kind of like a house from uh, the movie Sleepless in Seattle, where you uh, it looks like a normal house, like it is it is a real normal house, uh, but it's floating on water. It has like concrete and, and foam at the bottom, so it actually uh, is very stable, but also floats. Uh, and it was at a marina in Toronto. And I've never liked Toronto. I was actually uh, about to move to Europe. And I thought, well, why don't I just see if I can find any interesting Airbnbs in the area to stay at. And then I found this floating house. So I, I, I found it and then I, I kind of fell in love with it. And I stayed instead of one night, I, and I extended to a week and then a month. And then it was like three and a half years. And then I uh, got on a plane at one point and I was going to uh, an Arcapulco in uh, Alcapoco and uh, I met Joe Quirk on the way there who's from the Seasteading Institute and he was uh, he told me about their plans that they were building this uh, floating home in Thailand and I thought well that, that's amazing I I live in a floating home and you know so Joe and I kind of become best friends right away right there and uh, I said oh I want to I want to go and I want to see it I want to be there and I was already planning on going to Thailand for a meditation retreat. So I thought, okay, I'll just, I'll do my retreat. Then I'll go there and, uh, hung out with, uh, with, um, Chad, Nadia and Rudy for, for a week on, on the seastead and did a little boating adventure. Uh, it was a really fantastic week. And then the next week, the Thai Navy, uh, famously attacked and, um, uh, uh, our station, Thankfully, we weren't there, um, and that everything that happened with that adventure is being written into a book and a movie because it's it's quite a story of what happened in the next. Uh, it was like a ten day, a ten day adventure, uh, and that's it has all the elements of like a James Bond movie, but it actually happened. So it's going to be a documentary. It's going to be produced, like like a or, or, or like a, like a like a motion picture movie out of this story. Uh, well, it's being written first into a book and then into a movie from there, and we don't know who's going to pick it up. So it's it's hard to say if it's going to be a big screen. But um, things are evolving, and I think I think it could be a. It has all the elements of a big picture movie, so I think it could be there. So, yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, I just love, you know, the, you know, your, first of all, a big shout out, you know, to Josh Lopez, who got me in touch with you because I had posted, you know, this, this short brainstorm article about my vision and this film project, which, you know, I've, I've created a group with all kinds of Bitcoiners. And, mm -hmm. and I thought, oh my God, this, this would be, this is exactly what I've been waiting for. This is exactly, you know, the vision that I want to show as, you know, for, for the trailer, at least with a focus on the trailer, you know, the first five minutes just to, you know, uh, get, you know, get some excitement going and get the attention and, 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 and make people comprehend what, what Bitcoin is actually about. Um, so I find it, you know, hilarious that you just mentioned also, uh, you know, uh, that you, uh, that it, at least it's planned to make a, a movie or a, a documentary out of the, the, uh, the story that you lived through. Yeah. So uh, it has a lot of crazy elements in it that you just can't believe. And we've done um, a lot of research since then to find, to really dig and see what were some of the motivations behind it. And what we found out is something, things you wouldn't have expected. Like there's a lot of things be, um, below the surface that um, are motivating factors on the Thai Navy's part. Um, and there's a lot of corruption that we've discovered that is pretty interesting as well. Um, I don't know how much of that will make it into the movie. There might be, we may want to be a little bit politically correct or something and not talk about all everything, but we'll see what happens uh, as it evolves. Mm -hmm. But actually, you know, um, yeah, this is a, one of the most important topics when it comes to Bitcoin is uh, the, um, uh, you know, after talking to uh, Titus Gebel and Jeff Boo together with them on an interview on an episode uh, uh, from for those who don't know, Titus Gebel is the author of Free Private Cities and the co uh, or CEO and founder of uh, Free Private Cities project. So I think the first official project that's been uh, started in, in Honduras. So I really loved his book because it, it's about, you know, creating self sovereignty and and uh, and uh, and having sort of a private contractual partner service provider uh, providing all the services which um, you know we, you could expect or you one should expect from a government but just to deliver it much more cheaper uh, efficiently just you know restrict like the 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 tasks uh, of of the contractual provider or service provider to you know to the minimum like protecting liberty uh, private property private property rights uh, you know, well-being, security, safety, and everything else. Uh, you know, create a structure on uh, on a you know monetary deflationary economics with technologies that are even up to now you know beyond our imagination, let alone comprehension, and do everything you know much more efficiently and better, uh, and really live in a deflationary environment where the citizens or the contractual partners you know the who who go into contract with the service providers in a free private cities, whatever shape or form that might have to, you know, to, and this is what I want to show also, you know, in this film, like what, what, what does the daily life of the average person look like? Uh, and that's why, you know, I really resonate, you know, with this, um, with the sea pots and, and land pots that, that you have designed and uh, maybe for our, the YouTube uh, viewers, uh, this is, you can go on oceanbuilders.com uh, and take a look at it. Uh, yeah, uh, you want to like comment a little bit or describe like uh, what what was the uh, vision behind it and what are the challenges? Okay. So uh, when I first saw the prototype that we built in Thailand, uh, it was basically just a like a box that was floating. Same kind of structure where you uh, where you have this the pod above the water with the pole that goes into the water. Uh, same structure. It's kind of the structure of a uh, of an oil rig, where you have this deep water spar that goes deep into the water that creates. It's filled with air basically, and it, it it creates your buoyancy, so it creates a lot of lift. And then far below that, you have a very heavy ballast that acts as uh, you know weight that holds you steady, so you're not constantly moving around. And then you're tied down with three more lines. Uh, and that makes you very stable and uh, it actually pushes the, the house up over the water. So you're actually above the waves 
and the waves is, are where most of the, the movement comes if you're in a boat. So uh, a lot of times when you're in a boat, you can get a little bit of a, you know, you can get seasick. Um, but when you're above the water and there's minimum interaction with the waves, um, because you know, there's just this little slim pole, then you don't really move very much. So it's, uh, and you have about a hundred tons of weight down at the bottom. So it's very stable. Um, so that's the, 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 the basic, how it works. And the first one I saw in Thailand was just like a box. It was not pretty at all. You had, to, I mean, you looked at it and you thought, oh, okay, that's, that's, that's like not much to look at. Um, but when I saw it, I thought this thing is amazing. This represents what you could have. This represents, to, to me, it represented like the ultimate freedom. You could be in the middle of the ocean and have your home. Uh, it was, just wasn't very pretty. And I'm very, I have a very good sense of design, I think. So I've, uh, I hired the, the world's top aquitect for uh, designing floating structures or floating homes. Um, and so we, that's Ken Ulthios from uh, Water Studio in Netherlands. So we, uh, we sat down and started drawing out some ideas and different concepts and uh, sketches for what this could be. And we kind of went with the, the Jetsons kind of look, like the George Jetson look uh, of a floating home. Uh, instead of floating in the clouds, it's floating on the water. So we're trying to put in as much technology as we can into this because we want to make it so we're not dumping junk into the water we want to make it the most uh, eco-friendly home ever built, uh, certainly on the water, uh, maybe even on land. We're, we're doing everything we can. We're doing, we have, I have more than a hundred research projects uh, for various things that need to be done to, to really uh, bring us to where I want us to go. And I, I have, it's a vision that's going to take many years to accomplish. But I think when we, I think all the solutions are already out there. Like 10 years ago, we didn't have the technology to do everything we want to do today. But now there's so much that's uh, like, it's all right there. And it just needs to be configured and organized and put together into one cohesive small package of a house. And for example, the 3D technology, like this is something like it can, is it scalable? Uh, so yeah, we've been hearing that 3D printing technology is going to change the world. And so far we haven't really seen that, um, but I'm kind of now at, at really kind of on the leading edge of that now with what we're doing, because uh, we're, we're wanting to, we started originally, we wanted to, to get a very large printer to be able to print parts and to maybe be able to print accessories and other things that we could use. We thought it would be very handy. And then we started thinking, well, could we print could we print the house? Could we print the interior surfaces? Could we print the exterior surfaces and put them together? And then we thought, well, can we just print the whole house in one piece? So we're going through this, uh, and my engineers hate me because every three months I we have them scrap everything they've been working on and start from scratch to build it with a, to build the designs using a different kind of material and different um, kind of construction methods. So. Uh, but right now we're, we're actually, we, we just finished printing the, the top. We actually, we're not printing, we're using the, our 3d printer, which is 20 feet long and 16 feet wide and eight feet tall. So it's just massive. We're actually using it as a CNC router right now. And we're, we're, we're cutting out, um, the forms that are going to go turn into molds of, uh, the top of the house. So those pieces are now being put together. We've cut most of them out. We have maybe another week of cutting to do, and then we'll have the whole top surface assembled, and then we'll cover it with uh, fiberglass and gel coat, and you know that's going to be the start of our of our first mold, and then um, and that's going to be split up into pie shapes, and you know, uh, but eventually we're going to. I think within a year or two, we want to be able to print the whole house, uh, and they're already doing this with 3D printing with uh, concrete homes. There's already a few projects where they're doing this. So we have to do a lot of innovation to be able to do this with a with the house that we want to be able to do. Um, and the technology for that is still needs some development. 
um, because to give it the the strength and everything we need it to have, it's it's a lot of work, and we need to figure out also figure out all the right materials that we want to put in the mix. Um, so yeah, it's it's a lot of work, but the technology is all there. We just have to okay figure out okay we need this from there and like ordering parts and putting them together and uh, it's all there and that the the software needs to be tweaked a little bit to be able to do what we want it to do uh, and to be able to print a whole house we'll probably need instead of uh, usually a printer has one gantry where you're just you have one extruder on one gantry and you're doing the printing with that now we're thinking well maybe maybe we'll have two or three or four all working at the same time uh, well we may even turn the entire factory uh, into a printer and have the the printers dangling from the roof and do it that way and just the whole building becomes a printer so it's kind of out of the box thinking but uh, we do a lot of out of the box things that's amazing um, so uh, Grant I mean um, you know there's in this in the Bitcoin community there's always this talk about citadels and and sometimes I talk to some Bitcoiners and say you know maybe it's a disservice to the community when we talk about you know as if it sounds like it's something like utopian like far off so like a sci-fi pr project or concept so it's actually not I mean, it takes time I, I you know I get that and uh, uh, especially you know when you have all these parts and you describe that you know very well also on your when you on your website you you want you you know you, you I think you have a sort of a holistic vision of when it comes to energy uh, you know energy conversion energy production solar energy uh, sewage maybe uh, environmental cleansing uh, efficiency like these are a lot of challenges and, and, and I'm sure you know you must have like a time frame like like do you think like you, you will have like a first pro like living prototype in in 10 years time or something uh, no we're moving fast um, we are engineer our main engineer Rudy he's uh, on Christmas Eve I got a call at 11 o'clock in the morning said where are the designs for the central spar we're, we're going into production in two hours it's like what Christmas Eve you have people that are in wor working that are in, they're gonna actually starting a major project on Christmas Eve so uh, luckily within 15 minutes our engineer uh, emailed me the designs he was just finishing up them uh, them up so uh, yeah we we I love this team because we can make things happen. Is, is, there's a lot of people that talk about things that don't ever do things. And um, I love Rudy because he's he's just sets his sight on something and he's a bulldog. He doesn't stop until he gets it. So he just keeps on going and make, makes things happen. Uh, I'm, I've been an entrepreneur for a very long time and I, I do the same uh, exact thing I I try not to talk about things until they're very concrete until I I know I have the pieces of the puzzle to make things happen and I don't just sit around and talk about it like a lot of people that they, they just talk about what they're going to do uh, ocean builders is really about like doing things so like we're already assembling we, we built a manufacturing plant uh, to build our homes like we built it this year even with lockdown, we were building a, a, a manufacturing plant. A uh, manufacturing plant is 90% done, but it's enough to start making things. Uh, there's no boat in the world that would do what we needed to do to be able to get from, from land to our homes. So we built one. Uh, well, it's being built right now. We built a one scale, a one eighth scale model first, and printed it, and then made it out. Um, and now we're making the full size version, which is 20 feet long. Uh, it's made to dock with our homes, um, so that's being built right now. And we also have our one of our our first full size uh, home being built right now. So we should have the first home complete, uh, like the prototype. Uh, it's going to be a little rough, and, and it's not going to be the finished like you see in the pictures version. Uh, but we should have that done by December, January, um, and then from there we want to be able to walk around inside. And see, well, okay, well, this needs to be a little bit taller. Or a little, this needs to be adjusted. So we need to actually physically walk through it. We have uh, virtual reality simulators for the home, so we can actually put like a, a 3D uh, in, uh, like a simulator on and actually walk through it. But it's not the same as actually having a home itself and being able to like be on it. 
So we'll have that done by December, January, and you'll be able to come down and, and experience it. Uh, and we should, within a month or two of that, I think we'll be able to do the, the fi final approvals on um, the design and everything that needs to be on it. And we'll have all the final adjustments done. And then we, we hit print and we, we go for it. So wow. this, is, this is like next spring, we should have these things rolling out. Um, now we, there's always things that we can't predict that will come up like we couldn't predict, predict coronavirus. We would have had a model like instead of uh, December, January, we would, have, we would have had the prototype now. Um, but we couldn't bring out uh, construction uh, uh, concrete trucks to pour the concrete on our Florida or manufacturing plant to, to, uh, to build our plant. And we couldn't bring people out to work at the plant. So uh, we're, we're moving fast. Well, the Bitcoin is going to, I mean, this, this is what uh, we talked about that previously. Um, uh, I guess there's, you know, a number of Bitcoiners or libertarians very interested in these kind of projects. I mean, c can you share some thoughts? Like uh, what kind of people are really interested in making a reservation or, you know, pre-investing? Um, is that something you can share? Uh, well, I, I found out about this at a Bitcoin conference. So, um, the, it's just something that I think a lot of uh, people that are interested in, in cryptocurrency and Bitcoin kind of gravitate towards because it just kind of seems to represent more freedom than uh, any anything else that's going on. And we really want to create a an environment that's um, um, friendly for Bitcoin. And I think what we're trying to do in Panama, where we have a really good relationship with the Panama government. And um, I think this could be like a new version of a modern day version of Venice in Italy, where um, Venice for, for so long was the center of commerce in the old world. Um, it just became this incredible nexus for, for commerce. And I think this could be like a floating version of that and in panama in in america or in the you know in central america i think we could have something really special um the panama government's really excited about having um like floating th they like the idea of having these floating communities so i think i think we may have had hit at the right location the right time in the right place for for this kind of venture uh the, the panama government is very supportive of new uh, entrepreneurial activity. Uh, they're really into uh, supporting things that are good for the marine ecosystem. And we're building our homes to be very eco-friendly. So it's kind of a really good match, I think. And we're trying to do as much as we can to make sure we're um, following all the, the guidance, the environmental guidance that they have. And uh, we're trying to contribute as much as possible to the to the government or to the local economy. So we think we could have a, uh, a very synergistic relationship and create a really special environment that gives us a lot of freedom to do what we want to do. And can you can you comment a little bit on that, like uh, in connection with the pre free private cities that could be potentially, you know, a viable solution, uh, you know, because they are already, you know, special economic zones, but, you know, it goes beyond that, you know, so uh, how do you envision like, you know, the, you know, the, 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 the structural environment, money, economical uh, environment, or do you see, can you like, do you, can you envision something like that where, where you have sort of a, it's sort of a, you know, isolated city in itself where, you know, in a good relationship with the government, of course, uh, you know, with a stable, hopefully stable government, but where inside, you know, the contractual partners, the citizens can really benefit on all kinds of levels, you know, not only like tax wise, but also, you know, entrepreneur, you know, developing projects, uh, uh, and you know other uh, other benefits and incentives. Sure. So, uh, well, Panama is very pro business, so it, they make it very easy for you to uh, move to Panama to become a resident. It's like a, a super simple process. I became a resident uh, about three years ago, so long before I was even involved with this. Um, so it just coincidentally turned into the perfect place to be putting our floating home development. Um, so that 
that works really well. That's Panama is really well known for that. Um, Panama also has a very good structure for setting up uh, economic zones. They already have several and they already have all the templates ready to go. They just haven't done one before on the water. Um, so that's where some work comes in that we have to negotiate that. And we think it will be an iterative process. So we'll just, we're just going to start with the simplest um, existing template that they have for an economic zone. And that's something we can just take and implement right away. And we have like our grand design of this, uh, the, something that Titus G Gable loves, like his, uh, he has a bunch of bullet points of what the ideal zone would be for him. And we could start with negotiating with that, but that would, that would take a 10 year process. We want to start with something that's an achievable step that we can start with right away and then build incrementally over time. And as we build a relationship, we we're, we can be a great partner with Panama because we're bringing, um, we're bringing wealthy investors. We're bringing, uh, we're bringing a lot of cutting edge technology, bring a lot of high tech jobs. Uh, so there's a big benefit where, uh, you know, we've already created a lot of jobs in Panama. We're creating more, we're, we're training them, we're teaching them how to do new, you learn new skills. We're bringing really high tech skills there. Um, so there's a really good benefit for them and for um, the environment we're creating with uh, for the homes. I think it is uh, some place where, you, where you'll have a lot of freedom. Um, you have uh, an incredible view from your home, your floating home, and <clears throat> you'll have the tax situation in Panama is very good. You pay tax on what you earn locally. But if you have a business that you run in another country or that you, you know, do from do an online business um, or do remote work, uh, there's, there's no taxes at all. So it's, it's a really favorable system for, for pretty much everyone. And these days since coronavirus, uh, who isn't working remotely? <laughs> like uh, there's so many people, especially, especially Bitcoin kind of entrepreneurs. Most of them are, uh, very, uh, they're, they're into doing a lot of remote work. So there's, yeah. And you know, these, these kind of, um, this, this project, this, um, or this, this vision of creating, you know, sea parts, land parts or land based parts within this, uh, I mean, can you envision like something like, uh, you know, in, 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 in the ethos of, of a f creating a free market, free market principles, protecting free market principles and property rights that, you know, that we would have, uh, especially, you know, when you see now more and more adoption, institutional adoption of Bitcoin, like a circular economy rooted in Bitcoin? Um, yeah, so Panama doesn't have a central bank. So you're, you're allowed to settle your, your, your debts in whatever currency you want. The US currency is used for the most part, because that's just the simplest and easiest, most accessible. Um, so that is what is mostly used. They do have a local currency, but they only really use it in, in the banks. So when you deposit US dollars into the bank, then it converts into their local currency. And then when, when you withdraw it, it comes out as, as US dollars. So um, they don't mind if we settle in different currencies. So that's, that's totally okay. Uh, so that, Automatically, that just makes it so much more, you know, opens up so much, so many more doors for transacting in whatever currency you want to, uh, to pay in. Right, because eventually, it, it you know, it, it would and it can, um, and I guess you know, Austrian economists would say the same. It would converge to the hardest and scarcest money, uh, you know, which has all the pro monetary properties that we could have ever or any Austrian economist with a living or dead could have dreamt of. You know, uh, it's 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 absolutely scarce. It's it's decentral decentralized. It's it's portable. Uh, it's divisible. Mm -hmm. It's uh, uh, it has you know. As, uh, even you know, after twelve years, it's out of the bag. The cat is out of the bag. It's you know, Pandora's market been open, and uh, you can't censor it. You can't uh, confiscate it. So, I think it has every element, every property we could have ever dreamt of for really a flourishing 
um, deflationary economies where, where you know, finally we have done true capitalism, real capitalism, not crony capitalism, where entrepreneurs, technologists like you, uh, en engineers, inventors, investors come together with, you know, with the with the right, you know, community, with the uh, with the right mindset and ethos. Yeah. So this is what I envision for the film. You know, we go right into the picture and show them this is what life can look like on a daily basis. Yeah, we will have uh, we'll have lots of hardware to show you very soon, and we do have some big announcements we're going to be making uh, that are going to accelerate. Like we're we, just this morning, I got a text that uh, something very positive went through. So this is going to be like rocket fuel for the project. It's going to accelerate very very quickly. So. We're still going to, it's still going to take us some months to build out the first prototypes, um, the first full scale prototypes, and then go into production from there. But uh, we're, we're definitely doubling down on how fast we're moving. And this is uh, the announcement. We're going to be making an announcement probably in the next couple of weeks that's going to be very well received, I think, by the Bitcoin community. Wow, <laughs> you make it really thrilling. Okay, exciting. So, do you see like a competition coming up? Like, you know, you're giving me. I think if if this really evolves much even faster, you know, gradual and suddenly, as it as it's you know, as we say in Bitcoin, could we like see a competition or incentivization of uh, within other countries or governments? You know, sort of you know they compete with one another, and then we won't have it only you know in in in, in Panama, but maybe other neighboring countries or, or some other, you know, countries that are uh, conducive to this kind of environment and atmosphere? Um, yes, we, we do have a lot of other countries that are interested mm -hmm. and a lot of people in countries that say, well, what about my country? I, I want to do that here. So we have a lot of um, interest we've had from different places in the world. Like there's, there's a lot of interest, but we we're mostly focused just on Panama. We wish, want to make it work there and just do it well because there's, we're already doing so many things. We don't want to spread ourselves out too thin. So we're just focusing totally on Panama. Panama is a great place to start because it's also out of the hurricane zone. And for engineering purposes, it just makes it a lot easier to start there. Uh, so we can engineer them to go in different environments that are more harsh or where we may have hurricanes occasionally. Or maybe even I just had uh, some people ask if we can put them in northern Canada, um, you know, which is basically in the Arctic region. And I thought, well, yeah, we could we could probably engineer that, but we're not going to start there. So let's talk about that in a couple of years. Uh, check back with us. Um, but Panama is a great place to start, so we're starting there, and it just has the ideal situation. It would be nice to be able to sprawl out to other countries. Um, we're actually designing the homes so we can actually be able to to ship them like put them into into a container and and ship them uh to other countries so that's and we are actually talking to another country in asia that uh may start producing them as well so so yeah that's, we could have that sounds fantastic you know when i when i see those uh, amazing sea pods i'm like because i just read this book by j uh, j stores hall his name is he's a super like scientist and engineer like like quick practical one and he's and the title you know it's of course it sounds like really woo woo but or, or like far off sci-fi like where's my flying car uh you know these are the, the companies i think uh, that are de de developing this kind of new transportation technologies such as uh, volocopter it's a german company i think lilium do you see this like a potential uh venue for that or, or the, maybe the perfect location you know for the sea pods these these you know with i don't know with 24 uh, uh wings or what do you call it like 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 uh, sort of a vol volocopters you know like um, um no, man drone yeah yeah it's actually a drone it's actually a drone but but uh really you can take off vertically and uh it's got like propellers like 24 pro propellers and i think they're going to uh you know, we're going to see more and more test test flights. Uh, but I think uh, they're they're planning to to build to build out uh, infrastructure in Dubai for this kind of thing. So I can send you out, you know, send you a link. Maybe you can uh, maybe we can talk about this next time. But that would be like I see this uh, this kind of uh, you know this kind of project with sea pods, the perfect you know the perfect location for for a new transportation system. 
Yes. Um, so what's really interesting that we've been doing, one of the reasons why there's so much research going on is that we're kind of having to rethink almost everything about society. Like how do we, how do we take our garbage out? Like what's the process for that? There is no process for doing that on, on the water um, for a floating home. So uh, we came up with the idea that maybe we could use drones and we have your garbage bins in your kitchen when they reach, there would actually be scales on each garbage can when, when your garbage or your compost or your um, recycling reaches a certain weight. Uh, that's the maximum payload capacity of a drone. Then you take it out, you put it on the, on the patio, and then there's a, it reads a, a QR code sensor on the garbage so it knows what it is. And then it triggers an API call to a, to a drone that comes and picks it up. And we thought, okay, well, that, that's kind of the coolest way of taking out your trash. On-demand trash, pickup and delivery. Uh, and then on a more practical way of doing it, the more practical way would actually be having a drone boat that um, would come and pick it up because if if it fell out of the sky for some reason, then you have a trash problem. Uh, you know, that's kind of a messy problem to clean up. And you can take a lot more payload if it's a boat. So we actually are working on that design more uh, rather than the, float, the flying version. The flying version we may use for things like pizza delivery or, you know, food delivery or, you know, lighter things. Um, uh, we would like to do um, pick up by drone boat with uh, garbage, uh, recycling, compost, maybe even laundry. So you put your laundry in a, in a bin, that like a standard laundry bin. You put it on the drone boat and you, your laundry comes back in a couple days or you know, later that day. Um, so all these things can be rethought, like everything. Um, and come up with new solutions. And how do we get there? Well, we're building a special boat to be able to get there because uh, the right boat didn't exist. And we have had thoughts of actually making the top, like the roof, a landing pod or landing area for one of those floating or one of those manned drones. Like, um, why not? Um, it would have to be slightly modified a little bit, but it's not... We, we haven't been pushing that too much because the, we've tried to get in touch with some uh, of the manned drones. I don't know exactly what you call them exactly, but they're, we've tried to get in touch with some of them and they're not really at the point yet where, where we can bring them on. Um, but I think they're getting pretty close. I think within maybe six months to a year, we, we might get to the point where we can be like, okay, this, it's right, the right time to, to bring one in and uh, do some experiments because all this stuff is being reinvented and there's so much that may, needs to be reinvented and this is the perfect place to do it because uh, we don't have the infrastructure in place so we can just create something from scratch like we can create these new um, transportation models we can create these new um, city services models that um, you can't do anywhere else because when you build a home on on land, you, you it, it's everything's built in stone. Basically, it's uh, you can't uh, easily change things. It might as well be built in stone. When on the water, it's very easy to move things in and out, change things, reconfigure things. Um, so it gives us a lot of flexibility. And so things are going to evolve very quickly. And I think this what what, what makes this so exciting is that there's so much where there's so many places where this can go and there's so much evolution that can take very place very, very quickly. And there's so much technological innovation that's going to happen very quickly because we need to figure out so many different things and solve so many different things. And we should do this before we go try to go to Mars because all the things we learn how to do here. Yeah, I totally agree with you on that. You know, I mean, we can still go into space. And, you know, as Jeff Wu says, you know, technology is not only deflation, but it's exponential. And I think there's been just too, too much emphasis put on, uh, you know, on technologies that, you know, uh, such as uh, AI and information technology, computer technology, robotics. But I'm, I'm you know, let's go maybe, uh, I'm, I'm, this is the timing now, I think that 
perfect timing to go into more, you know, structural uh, uh, zero to one technologies, you know. And maybe you're right. Maybe a lot of things have to be reinvented. But, but uh, you know, as Peter Thiel uh, expression, I think I'm a huge fan of zero to one technologies. And I think the monetary structures, Bitcoin monetary structure will enable that much, much faster than we can ever imagine. You know, would it be material production, energy conversion, energy efficiency, uh, environmental cleansing uh, technologies? Um, and transportation technologies. You know, this is the most exciting part for me personally, but uh, yeah. Yeah, we have a lot of uh, transportation technology development projects um, that we want, like that drone boat uh, that we want to do. We have an underwater drone device we want to do because we, we want to have an underwater restaurant and underwater rooms. So we need windows and uh, to make them, you know, worth having, because otherwise it's just, uh, you might as well have it above water. Um, but what makes it stunning is having a window where you can see uh, all the fish. So it's kind of like reversing it. Now you're the fish tank and the fish are looking at you, right? You're the, um, so that's, to do that, we need to be able to clean the, we have to clean the windows uh, pretty much every day, because otherwise uh, it barnacles start to grow and it, it just, it, gets bad pretty quickly. So we need to clean them every day. So we'd like, to, well, why not build a drone that can go underwater and clean the windows every day or continuously maybe. And that would be, that would be a new business that can, someone can start as a, um, a home underwater home cleaning service or window washing service uh, and develop a drone that just goes and, and cleans all the windows or cleans all the barnacles off. Uh, or doesn't clean the, the barnacles off in other areas because you want the barnacles to grow because it creates uh, environment for life. And you know, to tie this in again, back to, to Bitcoin, I mean, uh, w once we have this monitor root layer and we have, you know, user-friendly technologies and it's it's evolving, you know, it's an incredible rate of speed, uh, you know, whether it be the lightning network or, uh, you know, and then the, the trades, the commerce, uh, the, the interaction, the human interaction, this is what, what, what my vision is for also for the film to show you know, uh, once the uh, purchasing power of Bitcoin will will rise, and it's and it will rise, you know, to an unbelievable because we won't we won't be there will come there there will come a day uh, in the next year, so maybe in the next decade, who knows? But maybe much faster than anticipated that we're not going to think in in fiat terms, in dollar, euro, whatever, but in purchasing power. Like, what kind of purchasing power will? Uh, each and every Satoshi have and uh, you know and I want to show like whatever that is you know uh, interacting with the drone interacting with the with the sea pod uh, so all these you know purchases and, and interactions and, and commerce and trade uh, on it on a, in a practical sense this is what I want to show and I think it's it's uh, this is I think what people need to first feel it they they need to see it and have a sort of a comprehension why why are we you know why are we so obsessed with bitcoin you know because there's too much you know just too much intellectual discussion going on and i think we need to break this down and visualize this so i think this is this is why and i'm a huge fan of your work and project and i hope you yeah we're gonna we're gonna keep this up uh this you know this sort of this communication i would actually love to have you with together with jeff booth maybe on a panel discussion in the near future sometime because uh, that would be a really fruitful you know combination because he has a like a, like a bigger picture of wh what does it mean you know like um integrating bitcoin you know hard scarce money with with uh, deflationary economics uh in that kind of environment right. Anything uh, else you want to share or I forgot to mention? Um, well, for Bitcoin fans, blockchain fans, uh, we're also, uh, if we're living in a community of other people, we need to be able to have some kind of, you know, there needs to be some kind of rules and so it's not total anarchy. So we're also looking at developing a, um, like a, an HOA kind of system uh, that you would, that would be based on blockchain. So you would have uh, the community when it's founded would say, okay, well, these are the values and things we believe in. These are the things we, we all agree to and you agree to them and they're, they're written in the, in the blockchain and they're not changed unless like uh, a certain percentage, a certain percentage of the community says, okay, well, well, you know, we didn't know what we were doing when we started this. We actually need to have um, some other, 
rule or some some rule changed, but it has to be maybe a certain consensus that has to agree. You have to have maybe 80%, and that's written into the actual founding agreement for the HOA that 80% of people have to vote on this. And you have an app and you just vote on the app and it's all written in the blockchain. If you get 80% of the votes, then it goes through. If it doesn't, then it does not go through. So you can't have some out of control HOA agent uh, changing the rules to benefit them or to, um, you know, to do things the community doesn't agree with. The community has to agree. And in this case of uh, the community, um, if you have a neighbor that you don't that you don't like, you can just move your house. You can vote with your house, which is a fantastic thing. Yeah, and you know that's something. You know, as I say, you know, this is uh, this goes even beyond democracy because it brings it brings uh, uh, the strength in it is is the transparency. And you know, if we you know we can do. I'm sure we can we could do all this what you're talking about into the into Bitcoin's uh, blockchain. Uh, and and uh, really have something that that um, uh, you know that, that minimi minimizes the intrusion and 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 really just takes care of of people like uh, protecting the property, the rights, you know, their uh, uh, the, the freedom and the well-being, the safety, the security. Which you know, uh, as I said, a contractual partner uh, like Ocean Builders or whoever that is, the service provider can do much much exponentially better and cheaper and more efficiently. And deflationary, <laughs> you know, with Bitcoin. So, any other resources besides ocean builders? Or uh, where can I, you know, direct my my listeners to? Um, uh, to ocean builders or the Seasteading Institute. Mm -hmm. um, Seasteading org, I believe. Mm -hmm. I'll put that in show notes. Okay. All right. Thanks so much, Grant. I really enjoyed. Uh, let's keep up this communication, and um, uh, and as soon as we are, you know, uh, hopefully mature and ready with with uh, you know with the first script and the the first concept for the trailer, um, we should maybe have a you know Zoom meeting with the whole team. Then. Okay. Yeah. Um, by then, we may have other announcements to make. That's great. <laughs> All right, great. Thanks so much, and have a good right. day. You're welcome. Okay. Thanks. Bye -bye. All right, that was a hell of a uh, talk with Grant Ramont, founder and CEO of, of Ocean Builders. I fell in love with this project. You know, not only it's like uh, you know, it's uh, one of the one of the you know few great projects that are out there, um, such as Seasteading Institute or T2 Scables, uh, Free Private Cities, who I already had on my show together with Jeff Booth. So check that out. Uh, and if you want to, you know, contribute in any shape or form, you want to help us, support us in Asia, whether it be, you know, funding, sponsoring, or you have, you know, uh, gifted talents, skills, experiences, network, uh, please get in touch with me for this film project. It's a real, like, film project. It's a professional. So what we want to do is, like, focus now on the trailer and the teaser, like, give a, an unprecedented, you know, a never seen before trailer teaser that really goes into the hearts and minds and souls. And comprehension, you know, of, of people where they understand for the first time why are we bitcoining? You know, why are we so obsessed with Bitcoin? What does it mean for for us, for the average person, for the eight billion people out there? What is possible with Bitcoin as a monetary root layer? What kind of you know flourishing, blossoming, uh, thriving, deflationary economics with exponential technologies on every level you can imagine? You know, uh, is possible? Is is reality? That is reality already. We just need to uh, you know to to. We've sown the seeds, and now we, we need to create the structures. We need to come together and cooperate. You know, and I mean, competition is good, but cooperation is much much better, right? So yeah, let's keep this going. Please give it a like, reshare, retweet this to every friend, family member, whatever neighbor, colleague you have, and uh, support support me. Uh, subscribe to my YouTube channel, to my podcast platforms. If you really love this show, please. Uh, write a positive review on iTunes or any other podcast platform. Thank you so much for your support, for listening, for your for your ethos, for your vision, for sharing your your questions and in and, and ethos. And yeah, uh, my name is Kevin Devani. I'm the Total Connector. I'll see you soon again.